Jerry Wolf is the vice president of Wolf Cattle, and he, which is a division of Riverview uh, LLP, and they are based in Morris, Minnesota. Jerry specializes in raising registered limousine, Angus, and Limflex cattle with a seed stock herd of more than 1,000 cows. And Wolf Cattle markets uh, about 40,000 plus limousine influenced cattle per year, purchased from their genetic customers and fed through wolf feedlots in Minnesota, Nebraska, and South Dakota. Well, uh, thank you, Walt. And uh, it's a neat, indeed an honor to be here in Tulare. Uh, appreciate the, what Progressive Dairyman has done in organizing these uh, panel discussions and seminars. And in particular for me, uh, coming from the beef side, uh, appreciate uh, a panel discussion and seminar here on, on why breeding dairy cows to beef. So what, when Walt had uh, asked me to, to start the panel, I had asked Walt what he wanted me to talk about, and he said, uh, give us a, a perspective from the beef industry. Why this is good from the beef side, and uh, is it sustainable long term? So first we're going to look at uh, some uh, industry macro numbers, you know, how we've seen cow decline. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, what we found uh, works well in, in building the right beast, you know, and not just using any, any beef semen, but using semen that complements dairy cows. And then I'm going to show you some data and how it's working in our feed yards and, and uh, some comments from the processor that most of our cattle have been going to. So, as Walt mentioned, I'm Jerry Wolf from uh, Wolf Cattle. A little bit about our company. Uh, we're an integrated company. We've been in business for over half a century. We were cattle feeders before we were cattle breeders. But in 1971, we were introduced to limousine. We were impressed with the extra red meat yield in limousine cattle, the feed efficiency and carcass yield, and, and have grown it to uh, one of the largest limousine herds in North America. We also, on the genetic side, we have Limflex, which is limousine Angus hybrid cattle, and more recently we've, we've added Angus to the mix, so we got a more complete menu to our customers. We still market fed cattle, that's our economic engine. We market about 48,000 head of fed cattle a day. Uh, so we sell genetics to uh, ranchers on the beef side, and now dairymen on the dairy side buy those offspring back, and, and those most of those 48,000 head of cattle going through our feed yards have wolf genetics in them. Our parent company, Riverview, is uh, in the dairy business. That's the name they operate under, we operate under on the dairy side. 47,000, right at 47,000 cows, we're about half Holstein, half Jersey. Uh, we entered, we uh, started experimenting with breeding our Jersey cows limousine nearly four years ago. And we've had those cattle uh, running through the feedlots and, and selling cattle to Tyson now for nearly two years. And I'll share some of that data. We have been using Limflex on Holstein. Uh, that's still a work in progress. I'm not going to be able to show you data on those today. Here's some industry numbers. Uh, going back uh, over three decades to 1980. We've, uh, on the top left, you got the beef cow inventory. We've dropped 25%, going from 39 million peak, where now the new numbers have us down to 29 million. The dairy industry, we saw a slide from, uh, 80, uh, a significant slide from 82 to 92. Uh, we've plateaued here around 9 million, but uh, we've dropped about 18% on the dairy side. Then on the bottom left, you can see uh, what the result of fed steer and heifer slaughter. You know, we're on a pretty steep decline coming into 2012 uh, and 2013 and, and 2014, that slide keeps going downhill. So uh, we're all wondering where we're gonna get our beef supply. That's all happening at a time, uh, we all know what world population growth is doing. We've, we come from five billion in 1990. We just went through the seven billion mark here a couple years ago and projected to hit 9 billion sometime here between 2050. So we got a, we got a challenge ahead of us, folks, feeding, uh, feeding a growing population with, with limited or the same amount of resources. And I think we have the most opportunity in, in, uh, in America. I was at a at National Cattlemen's Convention last week, and there, there was a slide there on arable acres per capita. 
and, and I didn't realize it, but we lead the world. We got uh, three arable acres per capita. China's got 0.5. Plus, we have, the, we have the technology to help make it happen. The net result of them declining cattle numbers is, is we got an overbuilt industry. We got 25% excess bunk capacity. I didn't do a slide on, on, uh, on packing plants, but uh, we just lost the Brawley beef plant here a couple weeks ago. At, at National Cattlemen's Convention last week, uh, the number that was thrown out by Cattlefax was they expect to lose two to three more packing plants in the next two years. Not good. So we have infrastructure to, to, to uh, harvest cattle. Uh, the, the beef industry's got their eyes on them nine million dairy cows, and hopefully you can help us produce high quality feeder cattle with, the, with that cow supply. <laughs> A little bit on the demand side, uh, just as you're seeing in the dairy business, uh, significant growth in, in uh, exports. The bottom green line there is exports, top one is imports. The huge drop in 03 was when uh, most of the world shut off their doors uh, because of BSE, because of the BSE cow that was discovered here in the States. It's been a work in progress, gaining that market share back. Uh, we're back to pre-BSE levels, even a little higher. And uh, we, supply the, we supply the world with high-quality corn-fed beef. We import, uh, we're a hamburger-eating country. We, we import leaner beef to supply our hunger for hamburger, and then we, we export a lot of high-quality beef. And we found we can get, uh, we can get that high-quality beef out of dairy cows just as we can beef cattle. <laughs> Here's the beef demand index. Uh, this is what consumers, this index uh, measures uh, not what consumers are consuming per se, because they can only eat what we produce, but uh, what they're willing to pay for beef. The dip in 02 was after the 9-11 the terrorist attack, and then the dip in 09 was after the, the housing and, and banking crisis. So, our industry does seem to be a bit finicky, and we're, we're probably the most subject to black swan events. But uh, here, too, we got uh, demand at an all-time high. And just in 2014, uh, we saw the fed cattle market shoot up to new levels, and uh, we're selling cattle. At, there's been fed cattle sold in the, in the mid to upper 140s. That's about $15 higher than previous highs we've made. So now I'd like to look at uh, why are straight uh, dairy steers discounted in the fed cattle market to feeder cattle and, and to packers. And we've been in the genetics business for over 40 years now. When, uh, when we're mating cows, we look at, at each, whether we're de designing crossbreeding programs for the beef or dairy industry, or mating individual cows within a herd, we, we identify deficiencies of that cow and then try and select the bull that best complements her, that has strengths that she doesn't. Dairy, cat, dairy cattle, and we fed, uh, we fed quite a few Holsteins out ourselves over the years to keep the feed yards full. Poorer feed conversion resulted in higher cost of gain, lower dressing percent. Dairy carcass, uh, you can see the ribeye, dairy ribeye there on, on the left is they're narrower oval-shaped ribeyes that are harder for packers to, to move because of their shape. And then lower cutability. Dairy, I, I asked Tyson this question just coming into the seminar. They said dairy carcasses will typically run uh, 5 to 7% less cutability than beef carcasses. So I went into the, uh, we went into the meat animal research data for some comparison. Uh, and uh, Meat Animal Research is a USDA meat center, or a research center in Clay Center, Nebraska. It's the largest ongoing study of beef breeds in the world. And uh, pulled out Angus and, and compared them to limousine. That first column there is residual dry matter intake. So the way that is expressed is, is if you use Angus as a base, if you were positive, if you had a positive residual feed intake, it would take more feed. If you have negative, it's less. So it takes right at eight tenths less of a pound of dry matter feed to put on a pound of live weight gain. 
On the, on the steers there at the center, the limousine sired steers had over an inch bigger ribeye, which allows us to pop that narrow dairy ribeye into a, into a beef ribeye. And then the four and a half percent on retail product. So we, can, uh, we found we can change these cattle quite a bit by adding uh, yield and product to them. We've had interest from almost all the major packers because of the proximity we're in. We, uh, we've been selling all our cattle at Tyson. We deliver cattle at Tyson every week. We call, these, uh, we call our dairy limousine and Limflex Cross as beef builders. Brad Brandenburg uh, from Tyson, when he heard I was on the panel out here, had asked if he could come with, and, and uh, I tried bringing him along, but then his, because of his busy schedule, couldn't make it, so I asked him, to put together a couple quotes. And since we've started harvesting these cattle two years ago, we've had no negative impact from the operation side. This allows us to run stable chain speeds, which has not been the case with dairy breeds or other dairy cross cattle. Brad Brandenburg, Director of Cattle Procurement, Tyson Meats. There's probably been no one uh, in, in both industries that have helped pull this through, and we like to call it pull it through. So they're on the other end wanting more cattle. They, they do harvest Holsteins and, and other dairy cattle. You know, they harvest all kinds of cattle to keep their plants full. They're the largest beef processor in, in the country. Not the largest in the world, but in the U.S. And uh, they've had a lot of people call us to, and ask us what we're doing because they've steered them our way. Here's a comparison uh, study we've done. It's just a small group of steers. Uh, they have a small research feed yard that's done at the University of Minnesota, documented by them. Uh, HCW is hot carcass weight. That top steer was one of the test group, uh, straight bred Jersey. And the bottom one is one of our beef builders, which is half limousine and half, half Jersey. We're also, I might mention, using homozygous black limousine bulls on, on these Jersey cows, resulting in all black fed cattle. But we added 190 pounds carcass weight. These steers are, are relatively the same age. Average daily gain, we nearly doubled. We went from 1.8 to uh, 3.5. Feed to gain, took right at seven pounds of dry matter. And these steers started at 900 pounds. And we went to about, we went to about 11.50 on the jerseys. And the, and the limousines went to, limousine jerseys went to over 1,400. But it took 11 pounds of dry matter feed on the straight Jersey cattle. You can look at quality grade. Jersey cattle are, are uh, actually dairy cattle. Holstein's fed right, do a, do a nice job too on quality. And that's what Angus are noted for. They're high marbling cattle. But so are, uh, so are most dairy breeds. So you see we didn't drop quality significantly. We got 4% versus 7% prime. Had a few more, picked up a few more choice. Yield grades were pretty comparable, but then at the bottom column is ribeye. We took ribeye from 11.8 to 14.8. So we've added three inches of, of ribeye, and that's where we pop them oval-shaped ribeyes into a nice beef-shaped ribeye with just one cross. Another quote from Tyson, these limousine Jersey cross cattle are outperforming our plant average for quality as well as not showing any dairy influence. We are actually getting a higher percentage of certified Angus beef in your beef builders than we do in Angus influenced cattle. And that would be Angus uh, beef cattle, cross beef cattle that he's comparing to. Most of the Angus Holsteins that I have seen in the past will not lose their dairy identity. Tyson Fresh Meats. So in summary, you know, this just to, uh, you know, as you step back and, and look at the concept, you know, I don't think we need to question whether it's sustainable. As I started, uh, our role is to feed the world with high quality protein. We got a growing population. We only got so many acres to do it with, so many arable acres. Well, we can run feed through a beef cow, you know, and there's always gonna be beef cows because we have, uh, we have resources that, that can't handle a dairy cow. And sell it right now, we're selling right at a $21, $200 fed beef steer. There's a cow that stood out there all year being fed to, to feed that steer. We can sell almost nearly that uh, much 
generate nearly that much, many dollars uh, on a beef steer out of a Jersey cow and sold over $5,000 worth of milk. So it's a pretty simple story to tell. You know, let's run those resources through a dairy cow, sell milk, and get a, still get a high-quality beef calf with the right complementary crossbreeding. 